So tonight we're going to discuss uh, what you see right here, uh, the white supremacy, uh, a cultural niche construct. How does it work? What we've been talking about and what we spend time with is to attempt to shift that internalized colorism, if you will, the sense that being dark skinned is good. And we've had moments, and the black of the bear, the sweet of the juice, Say it loud, I'm black, I'm proud. But they've been short term moments because we consistently exist in a broader worldwide white supremacist framework where color and one's approximation of whiteness is valued around the world. And those words are exactly what we're going to discuss. We're going to break that down how it works uh, culturally. The first couple lectures, we were looking at more evolutionary concepts. And I think the last time I did introduce culture as an evolutionary process. So the next two, we're actually just gonna be focusing on culture specifically. So as you can see this, this image right here, uh, we're all familiar with this racial hierarchy, who's at the top, who's at the bottom, and we're gonna take a look at culturally how this all works. Now, first we have to discuss uh, niche construction in general. So you're looking at a, a dam built by a beaver. And here you're looking at nests built by birds, spider web by spiders. Now in all those cases, the organism has altered the natural environment to its own advantage to become more successful. And of course, humans do that too. We build all kinds of things. But we also build cultural constructs. And that is like a network of social interaction with cultural values and standards and preferences and all those things that once installed in culture, you then become socialized by it and it's in your mind. And that's how you shape the behavior of millions of people in one direction or the other, usually to the advantage of the people you know, who create the culture. So I'm, I'm gonna take you to China to look at a very good example of a cultural niche construct and how that construct can affect the behavior positively or negatively of uh, a billion people. So this study right here looked at the cultural niche they have in China with regard to sun preference. So boys are more valued uh, than girls and they looked at these two important variables. Uh, the belief that sons were more valuable and the beliefs around marriage practices that also shaped the value of girls and boys um, in that culture. So because boys are more valued, um, they, they grow up and they take care of the parents, they carry on the name, they inherit the land, whereas the daughter would get married and move to the husband's family. So she would take care of his parents and carry on his traditions. So this causes parents to be a bit self-interested and they treat the boys better. Girls can tend to be abused, neglected, orphaned and so forth. So they have a long history of infanticide. And then once you had ultrasound technology and they could find out whether they were having a girl or a boy, when you mix that with the one child policy and the value they have for boys, girls were much more often aborted. So that practice, has now led to over 30 million girls basically missing from the Chinese population. So this has created a huge uh, demographic uh, problem, uh, but this is all shaped by parents and communities embedded in culture, resulting in 30 million girls being missing from the Chinese population. And this is not just in China, you had this problem in India, South Korea and so forth, so worldwide, you've got 60 to 100 million uh, missing women. And then the sex ratio, as in a lot more men, a lot less women, creates other massive problems um, within, those, within those countries. But it all starts from cultural values and preferences and how they can program behavior. 
And the construct we're going to talk about is actually much more powerful than this one. And this one is powerful enough that you can have tens of millions of females one way or another is removed from, from the population. And this is what the white supremacy cultural niche construct has done. It just uses a racial preference and a higher value placed on white people and their physical features instead of uh, a sun preference. So I took that same study and I just replaced sons and daughters with white and black. And as you can see, it fits right in with the experience we have in, in Western civilization. A preference on white, a belief of racial characteristics that are negative or positive based on what you look like, that then goes on to influence social interaction and how those people are treated in that cultural construct. So by altering um, the, social, the social construct that way, we now have differences in value based straight on what you look like um, by race. So now if I move to this section, um, tribal supremacy, uh, every tribe has a culture. They all build a culture to try advance themselves and become successful in their environment. So that's has been a natural thing all throughout our evolution. And you build your culture to your own advantage. So everyone, all people um, do this. However, these tribal supremacy systems they would all have something in common once they became really powerful and started to outcompete the other tribes around them. So the things they would have in common would be these values, institutions, and practices that worked so well, they now outcompeted the other groups around them and came to dominate them. So you could say it's a system that conferred supremacy uh, on their tribe. So regardless of continent of origin, so you can look at, let's say, the Mongols, how they worked really well, and they expanded and started dominating the other groups around them. You could talk about the Zulus or ancient Mali or the Inca or ancient Rome, Greece. You start with a core ethnic group. They reach a point where they're just working very, very well, and they start to expand. They start to dominate the others around them, and they build these, these empires. So you could call them tribal supremacy systems. And this is what happened uh, a handful of a few hundred years ago. These collection of nations in Western Europe, this is when their tribal supremacy operated at a really good level and they expanded to all these areas that you see in green. And this adds up to about 84% of the Earth's surface. So they expanded and others cultures were getting outcompeted and shrinking at the expense of Western Europeans who were expanding based on the way their institutions and practices are working at a really efficient um, level. So cultural competition is, is always on. It's part of what human beings do, and we've been doing it as long as we've had culture. So all tribes have their own cultures. They develop and compete with the other cultures around them. And this is why this image here looks the way it does. Now that image has shrunk, obviously, because people have decided to push back on those cultures. But a lot of people don't realize this is how it works. It all starts with culture first, before anything else takes place to cause dominance. It's how well the system, a, a ethnic group is using, how well their culture is using, how well does it work? in competition with the other groups around it. Now, this is also part of, of human nature because everywhere we've looked historically or in present times, you have group-based hierarchical organization. It's a human universal. So even when we got to Australia, they were separated from basically the rest of the human race for tens of thousands of years because of rising sea levels. So the Australian Aborigines, they originally walked into Australia because sea levels were low, then the sea levels rose and cut Australia off. And when they got there, you found group-based hierarchical organizations of the ethnic groups 
in Australia, showing that it wasn't something that came from somewhere else. They weren't influenced by another group. And of course, we saw the same thing in, with contact with North America, South America, and so on. You always find hierarchical organizations of, of groups. And this is also a product of cultural competition. Now, even within uh, these dominant groups, you'll have the dominant group acting in its own self-interest, while the members who are subordinate within that group tend to cooperate to some degree with the dominance, and that keeps the hierarchy stable. So when the subordinates get tired of being dominated and you see a lot of civil unrest or violence or something like that, that's when the hierarchy gets unstable and it can't be managed. So the dominant group has to use culture to extend a certain level of control over those at the bottom of the hierarchy to keep the hierarchy stable and they don't have to use a lot of energy and effort uh, to maintain um, the hierarchy, which unfortunately uh, far too many of us are doing. Now, the one we're talking about here, uh, I call you know, individuals like this uh, architects of the white supremacy matrix because they're great individuals so if you remember um, two weeks ago, we talked about prestige bias psychology and prestige bias cultural transmission. So because these were high ranking, big time respectable, prestigious individuals in those cultures, what they write, what they say, what they believe now has an influence on the culture because people preferentially pay attention to them. And if you know these men, they were all talked about the inferiority of black people one way or another. So these attitudes, they were being infused into this culture in, in Europe. So these, I, I call them, and obviously there's many, many others, they are architects of this white supremacy matrix that we're talking about. Now, because of what they built, this cultural construct, and then their expansion out of Europe into all the other continents, and because of the power of their culture to compete, their preferences and standards began to outcompete the preferences and values in the places that they went to. To the point where now we're today, you see the image here of a preschool um, black child who already can speak of positive values associated with white people and negative ones associated with her own people. And of course, for white children, they're learning the same thing, but they're also learning their location, their, their role within that culture. So at the same age, they're learning they're superior because they're white. The black children are learning they're inferior because they're black and that the white people um, are superior. And we see this uh, from three years of age uh, going upward. It's usually around seven out of 10, so about 70% of the children, regardless of what race the children are, they will speak positively and negatively about black or white or just dark and light people. So last week I talked about prestige bias. Uh, I want to introduce uh, content bias uh, this week. So because we've been using culture for like at least a million years, um, evolution has built our cultural capacity to attend more to certain aspects of culture than others. So certain types of cultural content, we just pay a bit more attention to it than we do to other types of, of cultural content. And some of, you know, like animals, plants, one's reputation, but also social groupings. So you could call that um, tribal identities. And this is how um, the children learn this without any direct instruction. So they can learn the basics of the race hierarchy before they go to school. Just as, as preschoolers, they can say the black child is the dumb child and the white child is the good one, the smart one and so forth. Because it's all learned automatically and unconsciously through observation. Because this type of cultural learning is an adaptation. So to make um, a comparison, like fractions or reading and writing, we don't have an adaptation for that. We need to sit in a classroom five days a week, year after year after year, being taught those things. 
but paying attention to social groupings and these other parts of content bias, so one's reputation, things like that. We don't need anyone to teach us those things because it's an adaptation. This is part of the, the evolved cultural capacity to pick these things up automatically unconsciously. So no one teaches you your accent. No one teaches you how to read body language. Your cultural adaptation will pick that up automatically. And it also picks up social groupings like this automatically. So if that information exists in their cultural environment, our adaptation for culture now will just absorb this without any direct or conscious teaching from anyone. So this takes us to a quote from uh, this evolutionary psychologist, William von Hippel. He's the author of this book called uh, The Social Leap. But if I can convince you of a world that's favorable to, favorable to me, then I can get you to back down in conflicts or defer to me. And this is a form of power. So what we were looking at here with the children is we are learning their worldview. We are learning a world that's favorable to them. We are supporting their preferences. We are looking at their standards and embracing them as good. But of course, their standards and attitudes around race are not good for us. It's good for them. And it causes us to behave in ways that either we defer to them, we're subordinate to them, we don't look favorably at ourselves we look more favorably um, at them. So this was the recent movie, uh, um, Exodus, Gods and Kings. Now, a child can learn a whole lot from this picture. And I'm sure you can see what's wrong with this picture right away in many different uh, ways. First of all, we're looking at kings and queens of the Nile Valley, but they're from Scotland and Denmark and places like that. You know, they're white people, but there are black people in the picture. But think of the status of the white people in the picture and the black people in the picture. Now a child can look and see who's important here, who's highly respectable, who's prestigious and who isn't, who is low ranking, who is high ranking. And when you get this over and over and over again, this now influences the associations with what people look like. The white people are central, they're splendidly dressed, they're important. The black people are on the side, they're serving, they're low ranking, they're low status. And this is what we're picking up um, from a very, very early age. So this links into what we talked about two weeks ago with prestige by psychology, then leading to cultural learning. So this is prestige bias cultural transmission. This image here is transmitting culture. It's transmitting learning. I'm learning who the important social grouping is, who the important tribal grouping is, who the important race is. Now this is maladaptive cultural learning. And again, it's learned without any conscious effort. Now the thing is it goes in very fast, like a fish hook, because we have this cultural adaptation to pick it up without any you know, direct conscious effort to do so goes in really fast, but it's extremely difficult to remove. So when you read books like Miseducation of the Negro, this is what Carter G. Woodson was talking about, how we're learning culture that harms us and helps them. This is how our performance um, is hampered through how we perceive our own ability level and how we perceive their ability level through this prestige bias cultural transmission. This relates now to how groups compete against each other because cultural competition is always on, it never stops. This is the way groups compete is to how well, how efficient is your culture operating? Now, if we're picking up, or at least many of us are picking up a lot of maladaptive culture, you now can't culturally compete very well. So due to that, we are now at the bottom of the racial hierarchy because of the level of cultural competitiveness that is dysfunctional or maladaptive because we're constantly learning to place ourselves in that lower racial ranking. I think you're on mute, Chris. Yeah, I so it said the host muted me, so I, I, it wasn't me. I thought someone wanted to say something. Can you hear me? You're good now, yes. 
Yeah, did, did someone want to say something? Because I one of you guys muted me. It wasn't me. I was just, just talking. No, not at all. It might have been an accident. Uh, uh, okay. All right, so I'll keep going. So um, after Carter G. Woodson's book in the 1930s, you had uh, this very influential 20th century psychologist, Gordon Alport. He wrote this book, um, The Nature of Prejudice. Um, after World War II, you know, they wanted to know how, how did they get so many people in Germany to follow um, Adolf Hitler and do what he did. But he wrote about prejudice in many different ways, many different groups. And because he lived in America, he, he did actually write quite a bit about black Americans. And he you know, made statements like this, that when you looked into their behavior, a lot of them, it wasn't that they were just, some were um, acting like they were inferior, you know, in front of white people, but didn't feel that way. But there were many who actually truly believed, you know, they were inferior. And of course, this is because of the culture they were in, um, in America. And this was during the midst um, of Jim Crow. And he also wrote quite a bit um, about colorism uh, as well. We might talk about that uh, two weeks from now. So what this type of learning does, it causes us to serve the agenda of people we're actually competing against. And uh, this is like um, the comment I showed you earlier from William von Hippel is, it convinces us of a worldview that is to their advantage and to our disadvantage. It gets us to participate in it positively, like this is a good thing for us too, to uphold the standards that are good for them and, and not good for us. And it causes us to defer to them when, you know, as Von Hippel says, we actually really should be fighting against it. And of course, some of us are, but not enough of us there's just a large percentage of our people that are socialized this way. And this is what makes our effort to turn this around really difficult. So their standards and cultural preferences are a form of social cultural power that they have over us and other groups as well. Um, but it, it seems to work a lot more on us because they kind of target us uh, a bit more, but it works on everyone who's not white. So this is kind of what Marcus Garvey was talking about. Uh, he, he makes this statement about why the movement didn't get to where he wanted it to go. He tried to change the world without changing the minds of individuals. And it was really this cultural problem that he needed to find a way to dig out before he could actually get large amounts of our population to act, you know, oriented towards their own interests. Because remember, a lot of black people actually were against him. You know, people like W. E. B. Du Bois uh, worked with, you know, the American government and um, the FBI had black informants, people that they placed within his organization. A black man tried to assassinate him. So this is all because of how they're socialized against their own interests. Um, so you have to attack the cultural problem before you can get, you know, large amounts of our people to actually support what's in their own interests. So uh, I wanna talk a little bit now about in the modern world, how it, how it can hit um, the individual. So maybe some of you have heard of this before, but Chadwick Boseman was hired by uh, an American soap opera called All My Children. And the first few days he was doing really, really well. And uh, the producers called him in and said, hey, we really like your work. We love what you're doing. Is there anything we can do you know, to help you? Whatever you, know, you need, just let us know. So he said uh, the role was actually quite stereotypical. You know, it's his mother's a prostitute hooked on dope. His dad's uh, either in jail, doesn't know him. He's a criminal, not around. And he's, you know, like some young male gangster. Um, so he's like, you know, I could move the role, you know, into more positive um, direction. So, you know, they kind of give him that side eye look and they say, um, well, you know, go and have a talk with the writers and, you know, see how they feel about your suggestions. The next day they fired him and uh, they hired Michael B. Jordan for the role. And after Michael B. Jordan was doing it for a while, this was um, his quote on it. You know, no dad, no mom, uh, effing stereotypical black role in the soap opera. And I saw the stereotype. So he says, yeah, I'm not gonna be doing uh, those roles anymore. So, when you go against the standards and the views they have of us, 
this cultural construct will punish you for it. It will restrict you. It will try to, you know, put you back in the corner. It won't allow you to go against those standards without a whole lot of, of pushback. And we saw the same thing here with comments from Alexandra Burke, the former X Factor winner and the singer said she was told this by music executives, avoid Afros, braided hairstyles, you know, basically just de-Africanize yourself. If possible, consider bleaching your skin, you know, do what, you know, appeals to white people. So again, they're trying to get us to conform to their worldview because the more we support their worldview, the more it supports them because it's not a worldview that we can do as well in as they can, because all the standards are geared towards advantaging uh, them, can get us to support it, that weakens us and it empowers them and they don't have to make much effort to do it because it's in our minds and we will do it, or well, a lot of us will do it without even thinking. So uh, we'll take a moment to watch this video of how it can affect um, people who are not black. And then I think maybe we'll stop there to see if we have any questions so far. My secret dates back to when I was 25 years old and I was working. Can we all hear that? Just want to make sure. Yeah, we can hear that. Yes. Loud. yes. Okay, great. As a local news reporter. Whoops. My secret dates back to when I was 25 years old and I was working as a local news reporter in Dayton, Ohio. You know, it's cold out in the field. I wanted to try and get a seat on the anchor desk. So um, I asked my news director, I said, you know, if um, holidays, anchors want to take vacation, you know, could I fill in? Like, I don't care, I'll, I'll work Christmas. And he said you will never be on this anchor desk because you're Chinese. And I was like, and he said, let's face it, Julie, how relatable are you to our community? How big of an Asian community do we really have in Dayton? You're, you're, the audience can't relate to you because you're, you're not like them. Wow. And he said, on top of that, because of your heritage, because of your Asian eyes, sometimes I've noticed when you're on camera and you're interviewing someone, you look disinterested. And all I could see was my eyes. And does he have a point? And I mean, you, you can see in like some of my interviews, like I'm listening to, like in this one, I'm listening to this um, sheriff's deputy talk and all I'm looking at is my eyes. Like, do I look bored or disinterested in, in what my subject is telling me. So fast forward, I'm like, I gotta get another job if I can. Um, I can't work for this guy. So I start meeting with agents for career advice, so on and so forth. And this one big time agent uh, basically told me the same thing. This big time agent had like the biggest names. Like if you open up his closet, it was like all stars. He knew what he was doing. On his own, he basically told me the same thing. He said, I cannot represent you unless you get plastic surgery to make your eyes look bigger. And I did it. And oddly enough, now I wanna show you, I wanna really demonstrate like what my news headshot looked like before I had this mm -hmm. plastic surgery done. I mean, if you look at the after, the, the eyes are bigger. Mm -hmm. I look more alert. Mm -hmm. um, Fabulous. Mm -hmm. yeah. More expressive. More expressive. Right. And but how do, you, how, how do you feel well, about yourself right now? now? Well, now it's like I sometimes wonder. But I will say, when I, after I had that done, everything kind of, the ball did roll for me. So... Um, there's a whole lot going on there with what, even the way some of the women were reacting to it. But the, the two men who told her this, they don't know each other. But the, the, the standards in that culture could cause them to act in cooperation with each other to tell her the same thing. 
even though they didn't know each other, as into something's wrong with their eyes. And of course, nothing was wrong with their eyes. That's how Asian people look. But according to white standards, according to their cultural construct, there's something wrong with that look. So if she shifts her look more to white standards, then the culture will reward her, which, which it did. Once she had the surgery, then she was allowed to move up. If she doesn't have the surgery, she would have remained possibly a field reporter. So she would have been restricted because she was choosing not to uphold you know, these preferences. And this caused problems in her family because they understood what was going on, that this was just you know, white supremacy, anti-Asian stuff. And um, you know there was conflict, but you know she went ahead and did it. But look at the pressure it puts on you to conform to their ways. And the more you conform to that, the more it supports them. And the reaction from some of the women, even the the, the black woman, saying, "Oh, you look that you look more expressive now," and so on, actually supporting these values that are against you know most of the world's population because a whole lot of people you know come from that side of the world that is their general standard look but they're saying make your eyes look better i'm saying better for who you see this isn't better for people from that culture this is better for this white supremacy matrix culture so i'll, I'll stop there and um, do we do we have any questions um, so far Thank you for that. Um, anybody with some questions based on what we just saw? Uh, very, very disturbing stuff, as Nigel Stewart just said in the comments, um, particularly, you know, that video. And it really shows we should be embracing our indigenous African cultures, um, not feeling that pressure to uphold white preferences. That is really a result of everything that's just been shared. So anybody with a direct question or comment that is relevant um can i ask hold on can you hear me hi is that pauline lewis speaking yes i mean how do we find ways to celebrate the beauty in our culture for me as a growing up as a young black woman i sought out um stories by um caribbean women writers and um, Toni Morrison and well, uh, May Angela, my sister introduced me to her work and I found the richness. So how do we kind of, um, this dominant white matrix culture, how do we find the beauty and love in our own expressions of art, culture, achievements to counteract this overwhelming force of social impediment, this thing posed on us? every day in our daily lives in our workplaces wherever we look yeah that i you're on to um the, the right answers when you're talking about our authors our artwork other aspects of our culture we can't just expect it to happen a bit naturally the way we tended to learn um, our cultures from whichever country or cultural background we come from if you're within this cultural construct, then you have to make a more direct and conscious effort to infuse this culture into your people, into your you know communities, um, everywhere. It's going to take a lot because if you're not conscious and direct about it, as you saw, it's it's already getting into the children as preschoolers. So what tends to happen is people may become exposed to what's better for them, let's say when they're finishing you know, sixth form or going to university and they start becoming conscious and start reading things and so on because they didn't get a lot of it at home or you know, in state school. But this gives the white supremacy matrix basically two decades head start, socializing us with values that are more to their advantage. So if you're not conscious and direct about how to shield people from these practices then you you get what we've been seeing and you get the struggle to kind of educate people the right way at least people within our own communities to move their behavior more towards what will support our well-being and move us away from this type of dysfunctional perception of self 
Thank you very much for that question, Pauline. A very insightful answer as well, Christopher. We'll take one more that was written in the comments. Uh, this is in regard to black people who are susceptible to all of this. How are they able to reach an understanding about how they are being brainwashed? And we do have one answer from Hannah, who says that it starts with education. Your thoughts on this, please. Yeah, it's 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 all areas of human social interaction are also displaying the ability for us to learn culture from it. So let's we tend to focus on media, right? But we have to remember when you know the the dullest and black and white images when those studies were first done, nobody had televisions in their home, so children were learning all of this just by looking at people wherever they saw people. So this is on the street in their interactions, even if they were going to all black schools, they still had these perceptions because they were in an entire society that was white dominant. And you know there was a lot of, lot of racism on, on display. So they will pick up all of that um, quite naturally just because our cultural learning ability is so sensitive and so good. So media plays a role, but it's, it's anywhere where you can see social, children can learn this from body language from facial expressions. You know, just looking at two people interact with each other. If the body language from one is more negative to, to the other, and they can put a group, a grouping to it as in one group of people react a bit negatively towards another group of people, by, by four years of age, children can learn that the negative body language is being directed at people with less value. And those people may look like them. So this is why you know, it's really important for us to understand the capacity to learn culture. So then we have a better idea how to counteract it, you know, how to have countermeasures to deal with this, because it's actually a much, much bigger issue um, than people tend, tend to think. Thank you very much for that. Uh, we've got two more questions remaining in this uh, before I'll ask you to continue. Uh, one came from Nigel again. How does this social and cultural programming work or apply to intimate relationships? Intimate relationships, yes. It does. Uh, as, is he talking about um, standards of attractiveness? Nigel, would you like to clarify? Yes, he is. Right, so we tend to perceive, as we all know, we, there's this big colorism phenomenon, right? So standards of attractiveness we, we are influenced by western standards of attractiveness they are out competing the standards in other cultures so in asia and in africa and amongst asian and black people so this is why we saw basically i can switch to the next screen um and you'll see uh, exactly what i'm talking about here if i can get it all right so this was going to be the next screen. And as you see, that that's Lil Kim. This is Julie Chan, the woman we just saw. And I think that's Azalea Banks down. She's skin bleaching. And you can see they're all changing their features more towards Western standards of what's considered um, attractive. And because men are oriented towards status, right? They're really, they're, they're a bit more status driven than women. And if they perceive that a certain type of appearance on a woman is considered attractive because they want to gain status and they tend to use women like trophies, so to speak, they tend to want to have a woman that meets with these standards of attractiveness that high status men are pursuing. That then influences the women to try to look like what men are placing a higher value on. So I think there was a slide two weeks ago where I said colorism tends to work through the men because women have to pay attention to what men are attracted to and the same way men have to pay attention to what women are attracted to. So because status tends to make a man more attractive than it does with regard to a woman, this is why men compete for status with each other. So they really fight to gain status because it tends to make them more attractive uh, to women, so they compete for that. So if they're seeing status is then associated with a certain type of physical attractiveness with regard to these Western standards, 
it enters through the men into the community, then influences the women to try to now bring their standards towards what the men are finding attractive, which of course, universally now will knock down, you know, uh, it will harm the reputation of the black race because these are, you know, standards that aren't just against us, they're unattainable. They are not good for us. Uh, we're not supposed to be pursuing these standards, but that then goes on to create other forms of dysfunction um, within, within the community, which we'll get into a bit more um, in the next lecture on dysfunctional uh, culture. Thank you very much for that. Uh, we need to keep moving, but there's one final question. Maybe you could speak to it very quickly as you transition into this next section, Christopher. It comes from Freddie Doncor, and it says, great talk so far. Uh, just wondering how much of a factor black complicity and also religion has in playing in setting up this matrix, especially for Africans. Well, first of all, there's a massive amount of black complicity. Um, that's why I started out the lecture talking about the hierarchy is only stable if lots of the subordinate people within the hierarchy cooperate. So this is part of how they cause us to cooperate by this early years socialization, this, this cultural programming. Um, what was the second part of that, that question? One moment. Um... So, so how much of a factor of black complicity and also- Our religion, right? Yes. Right, so religion is a big part of it as well because obviously they give us these images of people from heaven, whether it's angels, Jesus, and so on, this perception that God is, is white. So I actually did this test on, on children I was, I was teaching. I had a, a year six class and it was mostly black and Asian children. And I put all these images of gods from different cultures on the board. And I said, I want you one by one, go up to the board. And who do you think, which one is, is God? And almost all of them pointed to the image of God that's on, I think it's the, the Sistine Chapel in, in Italy, you know, painted where it's, it's that old white man with a beard and he's pointing his finger and I think there's some lightning coming out of it or something but this just goes to show you in a classroom full of black and Asian children all of them at 10 11 years old already perceive God as as a white man so if you perceive you know heavenly beings and God and all these people as as white then of course you're ranking that race much much better higher uh, than you rank yourself and there are psychological and cultural consequences um, when you think like that, performance consequences. Thank you very much for that, Christopher. I implore you to continue with your presentation, please. Okay, thank you. So uh, this is DeWanda Wise and she was in the Netflix Spike Lee, um, She's Gotta Have It um, series and she was, um, Put a lot of information in some articles on colorism that were in the Guardian and she said she was constantly asked to play you know these types of roles uh, baby mamas prostitutes criminals drug addicts um, because she's dark-skinned like whenever she would go for these roles she has a good opportunity to get it but when you go for the more positive roles then you know if they do want a black woman it's a lighter skinned uh, black woman but let, let's pay attention to what this is actually doing. Um, this is broadcasting and reinforcing these, the cultural association of these negative qualities with dark skin African features and not just to white people, but also to us because we're watching these shows. So if we're constantly seeing the darker the black person, the more negative the role, this is also cultural learning for us as well that will affect how we interact with each other our ability to coordinate and cooperate with each other um, at the psychological um, level. So this is one of the ways that this white supremacy matrix wins. It, it keeps us weak, it keeps us sleeping, it keeps us working against ourselves because this kind of information is being broadcast through global culture, you know, all over the world. Like I said, not just, you know, to other white people, 
but to everybody, including us. So this is, you know, the evolved tendency we have. So as, you know, a social group, as a tribe to attempt and influence others to conform with our values. Now, throughout evolution, this would have been great. You want the tribe to conform to those values because it causes the tribe to operate at a high level. Lots of coordination, cooperation, you get more success for the tribe. But now in a globalized world, you've got all these values from all these different cultures competing. But these standards uh, and beliefs around race, well, if, if other cultures around the world are being overwhelmed, you know, because of this powerful culture of Western Europe, well, there's only gonna be one winner because they're pushing that culture and we are pushing it too because we get socialized by it um, as well. But it starts with this, this influence we have to always want others to conform with our values. So if you're a really powerful culture, you can get people to conform with your values even when it's no good for them. Now, uh, this is a, a section I wrote about um, this is right out of evolutionary theory in terms of you have natural selection, but you also have cultural selection. So once you've built a culture like this, this culture now filters out people based on what they look like and what's associated with what you look like. So here's an example of that. So as black people, as we try to do better and better in this culture, it gets harder and harder to go higher up within the construct because it's trying to filter you out. So when you, you look at, let's say this headline from the BBC a few years ago, you've got university graduates, but they're three times less likely to have a job, even though they've got the same quality degree a white person may have. But when they see that name that indicates you're a black person on the CV, we know from several studies, they're less likely to get a callback or a job offer. So this is how it, it becomes harder and harder the higher you try to go. And, you know, don't be fooled by, you know, when some of the employment rates are good, because a lot of that employment is actually underemployment for a, a lot of black people. It's not at the level you're actually supposed to be. And we, here's an example from education where black students were three times more likely to be unjustifiably placed in the low ability group when they don't belong there. And this was out of the Institution of Education from um, the, what was it? Um, I think it was the London School of Economics. So this puts us at a competitive advantage because we have to work harder in school just to be at the same level. Because of the stereotypes that exist in people's minds, they're more likely to mark black children down, to put them in the low ability group, to discipline them uh, more harshly. And so, when you're talking about a culture that's filtering you out, it's just your way is just made a lot harder, which puts you at a competitive disadvantage to another group who are not being treated the same way. If they're not disproportionately being marked down or put in the bad ability groups and so on, well, that's, that's an advantage for them and a disadvantage for us. So cultural niche constructs, um, they can have cultural preferences for all these, um, physical aspects that we see here, height, body shape, skin color, hair type, facial features. And a lot of this you should already uh, know and have felt that the more we try to look like our natural selves, whether you're male or female, it can lead to bad social consequences um, within that culture, at least disproportionately. So if you point out, let's say lots of black people are doing very, very well, it's relative. It's how well are we doing in comparison to other groups? Are they facing the same obstacles we are facing? How much do they have to modify themselves to fit in and advance themselves in the same cultural construct? And when you have preferences like this that work against us, our way is, is always going to be um, harder. So the matrix uh, shapes the individual psychology of each person within it with, with a personal um, prejudice. And then that personal prejudice operates like this. So once you've shaped the individual psychology of people within the construct, if you're a teacher or a doctor, 
now you're taking this personal psychology you have with regard to what you associate with race. You're taking that into the hospital, you're taking that into the classroom, you know, you're taking that into whether you offer someone a rental property or a house or not, because the bias doesn't drop out of your brain once you go to work. So when we talk about these institutional racial inequalities, it's, it's first based on how the individual psychology has been shaped by the cultural construct. And as we saw, it's in children at a young age. It doesn't stop, it stays there. So now once it's in there, you get the job, you take that bias into the institution. And this is how you get these racial inequalities. So if I take you back to what Julie Chen was saying in that video clip, remember those two men who were telling her there's something wrong with your eyes and things like that. They had their individual psychology shaped by white supremacy values. And they could now take that and tell this woman the same thing, even though they'd never met each other. And this now relates to a racial inequality that she had to face. So here's another example of it um, operating. This is uh, Ursula Le Guin. She is one of the top science fiction writers of the 20th century. And uh, in the early 2000s, maybe around 2005, she made this comment that if you look at my books, you'll find that most of my central characters aren't white. You don't see it on the cover because they refuse to put people of color on the book jackets. So now the publishers, you can't necessarily call them racist. Publishers are about money, right? But they would notice that when you put an Asian or a black face on the cover of the, cover of the book, the book sells less because you know white people will be less likely to buy it if they see a non-white face on the cover of the book. And this is how bad it gets is that, you know, you could, you could see like a castle or a dragon on her book covers. Uh, those book covers sell more than a black or Asian face. So th this is, you know, an indicator of how that society feels about those people, that you can sell the book better if you put a dragon on the cover or a white face, as opposed to a black face or an Asian face. So once again, you're looking at a disadvantage, a competitive disadvantage for black or Asian people, because she would put Latinos, blacks and Asians in, in her books. But this is a selective racial advantage for white authors, their characters, their stories, and so on. It's more likely um, to be picked up. I've seen black authors talk about, some companies would say, we want to publish your book, but you know we don't want to put you know, this black face on the cover. So you know if we can do this, like some of Octavia Butler's books, I've seen some of the earlier ones. She was a famous black science fiction writer. And they, I've seen some of her books have white people on the cover when the main character is not a white person. And this is not um, a trivial advantage. This is how you broadcast your culture, positive associations with one group and negative with another. This is part of how this culture is maintained by constantly putting positive representations of yourself on the book covers, in the main roles, and so on and so forth, as we saw, let's say with hip hop, which does it negatively. So a cultural niche will increase the success of the constructor. Well, we didn't build this, but we're within it. And we experience negative consequences because it's built to their standards and not to ours, so it serves them. So from an evolutionary perspective, when an organism is mismatched with its environment, then it doesn't perform as well in that environment. So some of the problems we have with regard to our performance are because we are within a cultural construct that we are mismatched with. It doesn't advantage us, it restricts us, it disadvantages us, and it does the opposite um, to them. So here's an example of how the selective social advantage or disadvantage works. If you have uh, less or more intelligence, moral behavior, competence, attractiveness, if that's more associated with those white people in the picture and considered to have less of that, of these very valuable traits with black people, then you're not going to do as well in an environment that associates those qualities either positively or negatively with you. 
because this influences your reputation, what people think about you. So if you have all these qualities positively associated with you, just based on what you look like, you are now a selective social advantage within that culture. So without digging it out of the culture, then you don't really have the opportunity to do as well as the people who as a group have these traits uh, more quickly associated uh, with them. Okay, uh, we can stop here for a second if you want to do a few more questions. Thank you very much for that, Christopher. Let's take a look at our chat over here. First of all, we have one question from Shona, which is pretty interesting and got a reply from Nigel Stewart already. Asians have their own schools. Jewish people have their own schools and it appears everyone else but African Caribbean people why can't the intellectuals and articulate ACP group together and build or create our own schools? Or well, I would say, why, why aren't we pushing more or something? I know some of those groups do that on religious grounds. And because we share the same religion with this, the, the white supremacy matrix, at least here, because I know in America, they do have um, their own schools. They certainly have their own university system. And a lot of the charter schools, they, they can do a lot with regard to education more towards the interests of, of black people. Um, but here, um, we don't push for it. We don't have the prominent people in, in our communities even acting like this is a problem. So without people making the case for it scientifically, uh, pushing for it, as in looking at the damage that's done to young black children with regard to how they perceive their race and on those scientific grounds, because there's all kinds of research that supports that, then the proposal should be put forward that we need an educational system that attacks this from an early age. But who do we have in our community um, pushing that? And, and we would have people in our community push against that. You know, people like, you know, Trevor Phillips and so on, they would say, you know, we're, we're trying to go against assimilation. And I would say, what exactly are we assimilating into? Have you looked at the values that we're picking up here? But this, this is our problem. We, we're trying to gain acceptance from this matrix when we should be running in the other direction and building our own structural supports for our own culture, which is what you've spoken about as in some Jews doing this and some Asian communities doing this. They are reinforcing, reinforcing their own culture with those structural supports in the community with some schools being part of it. And there are other structural supports they add to try to maintain their cultural identity. Very good, we appreciate that answer. And I will also just chime in with the what Nigel had to say in the chat, which is that the center is trying to be that exact kind of a facility for you know, the African diasporic community. So lectures like this, um, and ultimately a lot of announcements that are to come in the future, advance the exact same idea, Shona. So look out for that, uh, everybody. The next question comes from Joyce. Um, and this one plays on mental health, Christopher. Are the elements that you attribute to culture actually an indicator of the mental illness or mental state that filters the world? And she provides some context or an example, like when children play a game of cooties, um, it doesn't exist, right? But the game master or the person who comes up with this sort of creates a, a frenzy or some sort of a, a, a mental state that, that allows them to assign this to somebody and the, the the person who responds to this would actually be responding irrationally and somehow go crazy themselves therefore owning the mental illness of the game master could you apply that to to what you're teaching over here uh, yeah you you can um because it, it, this causes stress, you know, this cultural construct, it causes higher levels of stress uh, amongst black people psychologically. And, and there are studies, I certainly used a few in the book. 
that show the, the psychological and cultural they cause stress and we're more likely to experience uh, some forms of mental um, illness and part of it is the problems we can have with regard to identity and not fitting in to what's favorable in in the cultural construct so there are mental health issues um, relatedly to this at least like at the population level thank you for that one last question in this lineup uh, from Hannah. The constant referral back to the very people who maintain the structure for help is, for me, a strange place to sit. When do we begin turning our attention inward to find our own solutions? What do you think about that? I, I agree with it 100%. Um, that's the perspective I take. That all of these appeals to, you know, um, probably I shouldn't say anything because it's coming up in some of the slides ahead. So uh, maybe we should just get moving and that question will be answered in a slide that's coming up. Exactly, exactly. Okay, go ahead then. Uh, thank you all for the questions so far, <laughs> very engaging and we love it. Keep them coming in, in the chat and feel free to wave your hand as well if you'd like to speak. Right, so I've called uh, this section uh, the ultimate racial other, and uh, I seen um, this author, Robin DeAngelo, wrote this book. Uh, she mentioned it um, that in the white mind, black people are the ultimate racial other, and in my research, I, I saw evidence to support this over and over and over um, again. And so, the white identity, in many ways, is built of the black identity. And by that, I mean, if, if you're a fast person, you're only considered fast if slow people exist. So if there are no slow people, no one's gonna consider you fast. For you to be considered fast, you have to be out ahead of people beating them. If you're running by yourself, you're not fast. It's when you're running with people and you're ahead of those people, now you're a fast person and you get all the respect and praise that you know a super fast person will get. So by that, um, here's a look at one of these, you know, studies that support this. So this is from uh, 2004, who's at the bottom? White Americans anti-black orientation is deep and filled with fear and loathing. And they feel less distance and hostility in relation to other Americans of color. So the most distance, the most hostility, the most resentment is felt towards black people, even though there's lots of other people of different races in that country. So to be the superior race, there needs to be an inferior one because the higher status people need lower status people to compare themselves um, favorably you know, against. So that means white superiority thrives on black inferiority. So when there's a reduction in our perceived inferiority, it's a reduction in the perception of white superiority. So basically when, when blacks advance themselves, when we're more successful, when we show signs that we're doing better, this now hurts their perception of themselves as in it, it hurts white people's perception of themselves because it's taken a bite um, out of white supremacy. And here's another study um, that shows that, this is a 2014 study on racial progress affecting how white people perceive themselves. So white participants responded to racial progress by exhibiting evidence of threat, like it lowered their self-worth. And so the progress of black people then made them think, made white people think, we are challenging the status hierarchy, we're challenging their position at the top. So this then causes them to become unsettled and have problems and even uh, the, the book I showed earlier from Gordon Alport, The Nature of Prejudice, he wrote about this all the way back in the 1950s, uh, how white people are comforted by black people behaving in an inferior way. And when we don't do that, when we challenge that, that's when they get uncomfortable. And probably a lot of you already know this feeling because you probably wouldn't be watching something like this if you weren't that type of person. 
maybe at work or in the corporate world or something, you've been around white people who are comfortable with other black people, but they're not comfortable with you because you don't behave in that submissive, acceptable way that makes them feel comfortable. So they tend to ask, well, I'm, I'm all right with these other black people, but this other person, what, you know, they got an attitude problem, what's wrong with them? And it's not that you have an attitude problem, it's that you are not one of the submissive subordinate ones. You don't lower yourself when you interact with white people, you don't behave in this way that is submissive and makes them feel comfortable. So they tend to now have a problem with you. They don't see that themselves as having a problem. They see that as you being the problem. Certainly I experienced that um, quite a bit and I had to actually change the environments I worked in because I was unwilling to behave in a submissive manner to make white people feel comfortable. And I'd already studied enough behavior to understand that that's what was going on, that they needed me to behave more in a submissive manner to feel comfortable around me. So uh, here's another example of this. This was um, a study by Eberhardt and colleagues. Uh, she wrote that book called Biased, came out a few years ago. Really good book. She's a, a black psychologist who teaches at Stanford. So what they did is they looked at tough on crime policies in New York State and in California. And they found that, it's, so this is like stop and search and three strikes laws, things like that. The more those policies put black people in prison, the more white people supported the policy. The more they felt the policy wasn't gonna be as harmful to black people, they then would decrease their support for the policy. So this is that same thing when you're seeing blacks making a status move, they become uncomfortable if it's in the wrong direction. So when you know we're face down in the mud, a lot of them feel more comfortable as opposed to when we're doing well, we're advancing as a group in some way, shape or form, it then causes uh, problems like what we've seen uh, the past year. So because we are a hierarchical status sensitive species <clears throat> um, individually and by social groupings, by race, by ethnic group, even by nationality, when, when groups make status changes, it then challenges groups who may be higher status than them because they feel now, you know, where you're, someone's coming um, for their spot. So they pay attention, but particularly they pay attention to people or groups that are lower than them. So with us being the ultimate racial other, that makes us the ultimate racial uh, threat. So we can never hide, you know, we're always gonna be monitored because if they're superior, perception of themselves is dependent on seeing us as inferior, then they, at least unconsciously, and some of them it's obviously, you know, more overtly, they need to see us in the lower position. And when we make changes in that, that's when you get backlash or sideways attacks at what we're doing. So just, you know, by some of these black players kneeling to say they're sick and tired of the racism they face in the stadiums and online, you get white people and primarily it will be white males if you if you you know did an investigation who are the ones who are going to boo because if this does change anything this is a status threat to them so they're the ones who are going to be most likely to perceive it and respond negatively so um, there's a section where i write about how we have to change our response um, to white supremacy it's not for us to try and change um, their culture to gain acceptance. Uh, this is a culture built for them. So it's never gonna give us an equal you know, level of you know, treatment and um, status within it. It's organized around advantaging them. And the more we try to change it, the more you get pushbacks or it adapts to the changes they make. But in all this effort to try to change their culture, we're ignoring our own cultural development. We don't need to be making changes to them, at least not directly, because if, if you change yourself, people change how they respond to you, not based on you telling them to do anything. If you've improved yourself, if you've made yourself stronger, you've improved your ability level, people will recognize that and then they will start to treat you differently. So if we focus on our own cultural development, improving our own situations, our own well-being, how we're managing 
all these areas socially that we need to improve. Then people change how they respond to you anyway, but we shouldn't be paying attention to them that way, trying to get them to directly change and treat us better. If we work hard with each other, to change our own development, improve it, uh, to become more culturally competitive. This is how we get really what, what we're looking for. So by neglecting our own you know, cultural development, we've not built up our ability to be more culturally competitive. Like an example would be what we just heard from one of the questions, how Asians and Jews you know, having their own schools, the, which would be considered a structural support to reinforce standards and cultural perspectives that are really healthy for them. This is how you work on yourself without you know, having to go to them to make changes for you. And because we're not working on our own cultural competitiveness, this is why we're at, at the bottom of the racial hierarchy. So now, now you know who you're, you're fighting. You know, you're fighting the white supremacy matrix. You're fighting a culture. You know, not white people, but it operates mostly through white people, but it operates through us as well. Because once it's in us, we are now behaving in a way that is cooperative and supportive to the white supremacy matrix, which has global reach and power because the West is the most powerful culture we've ever seen with global reach to outcompete cultures even on their own continents. So you'll see Western standards affecting all this plastic surgery people are getting in South Korea or billion dollar skin bleaching industries in India and Africa and Brazil and places like that. This is the power of the white supremacy matrix to outcompete the standards in other cultures. Um, it, how are we on time? Because we, we don't have to do this section. Um, I think we will actually be very good on time. Uh, you may go ahead with it. Okay, so these... I, I was wondering though, sorry to sure. chime in, if we could have a round of questions because there's so many great questions in the chat. In fact, uh, so sure. right, Nigel, it is, it is going off in the chat and in fact, it would be healthier to let this out right now. Um, first of all, I would like to return to one question from Sibu Siso. I'm sure it can tie in very well to this uh, discussion now. Is it necessary to give attention to race? What are the possibilities of spending our energy teaching that race is not true, rather invest in humanity, love, other kinds of virtues? Okay, well, I, I would kind of answer that question with a question. Um, does the white supremacy matrix pay attention to race? And how successful has that cultural construct been by paying attention to race. <laughs> I like that. Uh, so, we will let that. I'll answer. add on a little bit to that in that we, we, we are not um, staying in a mindset of understanding that we are in a competition. So an example I like to say is, look, no matter how nice things may be in my home, you know, for my family and children and everything, I still have to pay attention to what's going on externally in terms of locking doors, making sure this home is protected. Because no matter what beauty I create, create in here, if the competitors outside my door get in here and want to manipulate and exploit and use whatever resources I have in here, then the beauty in here means nothing because I don't have the ability to protect it. So you must always be in a competitive context. And so, race identity has been used by the white supremacy construct to outcompete other groups. Racial identity has played a role in who they will let through and who they will not. They've used it as a tool to outcompete other groups. So if you, it's basically saying, look, do we need the machine guns and the cannons and the aircraft carriers? Why can't we just focus on peace and loving each other as black people and so forth. The problem is the competitors have aircraft carriers. They have jet fighters, they have machine guns. So if we don't have those tools of competition as well, then whatever beauty we create for ourselves, we won't be able to protect it. So to round this off, tribal identity is important, 
because this is how you build coordination and cooperation. It's built around an identity. So if we're not building it around race, what are we building it around that is gonna cause us to protect it? Because the problem we all face, regardless of where we are from. So if you're from the Congo or Jamaica or America or whatever, if you're black, you are facing this problem. So I'm kind of leaving it out there to you. Um, how do you coordinate around an identity if it's not going to be race? And I'm leaving that as an open question that we can debate. Interesting, and I'd like to interject with one of, one of the more recent questions that came in from Pauline. It ties in very well, because you mentioned that, you know, the other groups have machine guns and all of these sort of advancements or technologies and resources. The question is then, how can we increase our cultural competitiveness with our resources, economics, skills, and intellect? What, what, is, what is the way forward then? Um, I'm, I'm going to pass that to Nigel because that's supposedly lecture number six. So I don't know if he wants me to, to get into all of that. Um, but certainly there are um, a lot of the science I'm giving you here is giving us the clues um, to how we have to do it. Because if you want to get a large population of people to co cooperate towards the objective that's going to help that population, then the only thing that's going to do that is culture. So this is how you manipulate the behavior of millions of people. And it's gonna take something like that um, to do it. Very good. And just as your slide with Sterling on his knee came on, uh, we received a message as well from Marcus and it tied in, you know, isn't this what we are seeing with black football players? And you touched on it very briefly, um, who are pushing for more racial equality. White people are, are threatened that the status quo may change. So therefore they resort to racist abuse via social media. What do you think about that? I think that's spot on. They, those players kneeling and highlighting racism is challenging that because racism is the tool that is used to maintain the hierarchical relationship. So. Humans have a, a status sensitivity, you know, detection mechanism. So as soon as something comes up that's going to challenge the hierarchy, they look for ways to try to break it down. So now you're hearing all this talk about, well, critical race theory is bad and we have to go after Black Lives Matter. And the thing is, wh whether you agree with those things or not, anything that seeks to try to, first of all, label and point out all this racism that's taking place, this is an attack on the reputation of white people and particularly white men. So of course, no one wants their reputation attacked and, and dragged through the mud. So they're trying to push that away while at the same time maintain the behaviors that continue to keep this hierarchical organization by race um, operating well. Because if you tear down the racism and people get more on a level playing field, it's a problem for them. And if you remember the first lecture where I talked about how black people are perceived differently. So we're perceived a bit more threatening or at least contextually threatening than some other groups. So they pay attention to us in a way that they don't pay attention to other groups. So they may pay attention to let's say, excuse me, um, East Asians as an economic threat, but they don't perceive them as a physical threat. They perceive us as a physical threat. So that's more in their face and they respond more quickly, more powerfully to the threat we represent than other groups do. And, and of course they base their superiority on black inferiority. Very good. Now I wanted, I wanted to ask you very quickly, Christopher, are you familiar with the ISIS papers by Dr. Francis Cress Welshing? Yes, I am. All right, we have a question from Hannah in regards to this. Uh, she says, in relation to this area that Christopher is currently exploring, uh, it is highlighted in areas of the ISIS papers. And she is interested to hear your thoughts about these elements of her book. Right, so um, Dr. Wilson, she didn't really have the benefit of a lot of the, the 21st century science um, we have now that I'm using but still her instincts were just really good. 
So she understood she would talk about um, genetic annihilation that white people would fear from the, the colored peoples of the world. And she would see black people as having the greatest ability to genetically threaten white people. And, and she's onto something. This tends to be exactly how they feel to a certain extent. Um, so there's, she talked about the fear um, that they have of us and how we are to respond to it. You know, she talked about justice and, you know, the system of white supremacy and so forth and what we can do about it. Um, I, I guess I would tend to not agree with some of the things she talked about in terms of getting justice. Um, you're not gonna be getting any justice um, from them. Uh, Intergroup competition is the way it's always been and it's the way it's gonna be for a long way forward. And we have to be about the competition, um, not about talking to the competitors and trying to get them to change their behavior. But uh, like Dr. Wilson said, they do have this very powerful feeling of threat from black people. Um, in some ways she was a bit controversial because when I, when I talk with some groups of people, um, there, there are, I would say, um, cause she talked about that, the protection of black people, whatever, how we're gonna make it, it has to go through the men. The men have the ability, the ability to protect. So for black women and children, you have to be able to build up the men to be able to then defend the rest of, of the community. And I think, I guess that's controversial with, with some groups now, but looking at it purely from a scientific and evolutionary perspective, that is exactly how it's played out through history. If you take out the men, the rest of the community has nothing. They have no way to defend themselves. Once the men have built themselves up, that community is, is defended. And I specifically remember um, Dr. Wilson writing about that in the book. I'm sorry I've talked a bit too much about Dr. Wilson, but I have a lot of respect for Dr. Wilson because she, she did it, she did it right. And she did it without a lot of the science we currently have today. You know, she was just a, a really great warrior for our community. So enough respect to Dr. Wilson. That's amazing. And uh, Joe Dash has just shared that another great book on this is Adam's Curse by Brian Sykes, who breaks down the fate of European genealogy. So if you're interested in looking up any of those guys, please do so. Now, one last question before we continue, Chris. It came from Dao, and I, I hope I'm pronouncing your name properly, Dao, but I had first thought this was a strange question until... Uh, Hamika Jamika, I'm so sorry if I'm not pronouncing it correctly, also came through and, you know, uh, uh, seconded the question. Do you think, oh, excuse me, ha, has there been a study of what proportion of white Americans are actually people of color? And by that, uh, it's sort of about how, you know, Hamika says she was watching a genealogy show and a white man had his DNA tested and he did not look happy with the results. He had a small percent of African DNA and he lived in Texas. Yeah, well, that, that's, that's gonna happen um, because you know, unlike England, they kept a lot of their enslaved peoples in the same country where they were living, you know, the, the socially dominant group, uh, white Americans. So they are mixed up a lot with, with um, Native Americans and African Americans, although the major flow has been European genes into the black gene pool, as opposed to black genes into the European gene pool. So they have a much smaller percentage of African DNA in them, as opposed to the amount of European DNA that is within the African American population. So their percentages are like around 20% on average for African-Americans. So they tend to be like 80% black and like 20% European ancestry. Whereas with Europeans, their ancestry in reverse is more like, you know, four or 5%, you know, um, being black. So they do have it, they do have a touch of it, but because most of this happened during the period of enslavement through, you know, rape and all those kinds of things. Although the flow right now is from the black community into the white community. So the gene flow is now reversed. It's more black ancestry flowing into the white American population. All right. Thank you very much for that. 
in the interest of time, I'll invite you to continue uh, with these slides. We have so many good comments uh, and insights from the community. Keep them coming, guys. Um, and we'll see if we can touch up on them as soon as he concludes his slides. Yeah, the slides will be finished in about 15 minutes. So is that okay? Yeah, that's okay. Then we'll leave us with about 15 for Q and A's and, and discussion. Okay. So uh, we have uh, these four questions of uh, evolutionary analysis of an adaptation and behavior. So with regard to tribal dominance behavior in humans, um, the first question is what is the function of the behavior? And this is, it was designed to provide a tribe an evolutionary advantage over the other tribes and ethno-linguistic groups that they would compete against. And this would have all been taking place um, in Africa long before humans, or I should say homo sapiens, left the African continent and migrated into the other continents. So all of this was taking place for hundreds of thousands of years, shaping our, our evolution towards this um, behavior pattern. So how did it evolve? Um, Intergroup prejudice and discrimination evolved as the strategy for dealing with the difficulties um, that outsider tribes were, the threat they were to the success of the tribe or survival of it or the expansion of it. So um, as evidence of that, um, excavations in Egypt, Germany, and America, we found mass graves that are indicative of you know, very high levels of violence and the, the injuries on the skeletons, you know, bashed in skulls, you know, they find arrowheads and things like that embedded um, in the bones. Um, this is all from injuries from human tools and um, organized violence. So wherever people were living in proximity, we found a very high level of manslaughter, murder, and archaeological evidence showed um, this was within range of most, you know, settled, you know, um, societies. So how does it work? So humans are sensitive uh, to ethnic differences. Um, it's not really something I have to tell you. We all have this ability, so you know that we do this. We're sensitive to accent and body language, culture, physiology, all of these things. Now, because race didn't exist, race is very recent because we were all in Africa and we were all black. But all these other things did exist. All these ethnic, linguistic, physiological, um, hair form, the way we're adorned, all these things did exist and we're very sensitive to them. But because race is also a very easy ethnic marker to see, and once you have these markers, people tend to think you're in alliance, that you're a group that tends to cooperate with each other, which then plays into the tribal psychology that we have. So even though this all evolved to detect ethnicity, race basically tricks the brain into perceiving it as ethnicity. So all the psychological machinery that evolved for us to compete with other ethnicities it now also works with regard to, to race. So we note these differences automatically. So age, sex, and race are automatically encoded um, into the brain. We've only been able to reduce the encoding of race um, somewhat under laboratory conditions. Um, so it is scientifically possible to kind of reduce the encoding of race in the brain but it, it's, it's very difficult to do. And we certainly don't live in societies now where that's not going to happen. So age, sex, and race, your brain automatically documents and records it. So once it does that, then what is associated with race can also now play a role in your behaviors. So this is how you can get you know, the exclusion, the exploitation, the avoidance, and the other things we do to prejudge and discriminate against other groups of people. So how it develops, we've talked a bit about this, uh, I think in all three lectures, um, because it's really important that we look at how do children come across these attitudes with regard to race and absorb it. So it develops in infancy, we're automatically learning cultural information, associating it with groups, and then it starts to play a role um, in behavior. So this is how we get our tribal psychology programmed by the cultural information that we can pick up very, very quickly because of our evolved capacity uh, to learn it. So the system of white supremacy has 
evolutionary goals. You know, the tribal supremacy constructs we build, they're trying to advance us, they're trying to build our success, they're trying to defend us uh, also, but because it has evolutionary goals, that means it's always gonna adapt uh, to changes in its environment because our, our tribal status psychology will always push us to want to reach these goals because it's been good for our tribes to push and, and get these goals. The success of the tribe trickles down to the success of the individual. So when we looked at the selective social advantage that white people enjoy in the white supremacy construct, that is an evolutionary goal. Pursuing status is an evolutionary goal. So this cultural construct will always adapt to changes to continue to try to pursue those goals. So we have to be really conscious of that in our under A good example is when segregation was ended in America and you had the civil rights movement, as soon as they got finished fin destroying that, you got mass incarceration that came along. So you could call that an adaptation of the white supremacy matrix where one way of restricting our population was destroyed. They adapted and came up with a new way of restricting us, which of course is going on right here in, in England as well. You know, I spent an entire chapter talking about that. So white supremacy is trying to secure what, what I call the, the, the first movers advantage. And the first movers advantage means you, you get such a big lead that you never get caught. And for the most part, they felt that, you know, that they had done that, that they put themselves in a position where they would always be, you know, top dog, that no one was gonna have the ability to catch them. But the reason race is in the news, you know, so much now when if you're old enough, you know, we weren't talking about race. It certainly wasn't in the news as much as you see it um, now is because they're feeling some big challenges uh, in different areas and from different people. So one of the ways that black people are challenging them is with uh, black women have higher fertility rates and humans at tropical latitudes produce more females. So more females mean more ovaries, more wombs, more children. So, and this is uh, right now, the African population is, is at an unprecedented level of you know, demographic growth, fertility that we've never seen this before in, in human history. So if you look at the black line there, Sub-Saharan Africa, that is our population growth over the next um, 79 years. So it's just, like I said, never before seen in human history. And if you're, um, now that, that's not my title. You see where it says the world's most important graph. I took that from a, a site where the people who are worried about us are putting this information out there. For them, it's the world's most important graph because this population growth of black people is threatening to them. As you can see, the blue line is Europe. And as you can see, that's gonna go down. But um, this is what we're looking at here. Um, in 79 years, the projections are that 40 to 50% of the human species will be black. So as you can see with this headline, look at what they've capitalized. So they're showing you what's really notable about this population growth, that half will live uh, in Africa, half of the world's population are gonna be black people. Now, throughout history, when you have this kind of demographic growth, um, this is a challenge to whoever is not growing or who may be shrinking. And, and some of you are obviously aware that uh, the white population is in demographic decline. So they're feeling threatened. Now we're not trying to threaten anyone, you know, this is all just natural um, for us, but um, they have to look at this as a problem. Um, apartheid was toppled in Africa by the population explosion of, of the South, black South African population. So mid 20th century, um, the ratio was about four black South Africans for every one white South African. But by the end, the ratio was nine to one. And when you looked at the information that was coming out of some of the intelligence agencies, um, they were long before, you know, Mandela came out of jail and all these other things. They said, look, uh, apartheid's on its last legs. It simply cannot survive with that type of demographic growth of the black population. You're just not gonna be able to control them. 
So, you know, in my book, you know, I did talk about Mandela and stuff. I said, look, this was really, this was won by Black South African women who, you know, were turning out five and six children. Because when you, when you turn out more people, your culture grows as well, because the children are inheriting the culture of their parents. So this isn't just a growth of Black people. This is a growth of Black culture. So with half the people in the world, you know, projected to be Black, it's really important for us to start managing okay. our cultural development um, better. Someone had a question? I think that was an accidental microphone. Uh, you, I, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I got about maybe three minutes left. Um, so in terms of culturally what we need to do, uh, time is running out because with the European population feeling a bit more under threat, and of course, we have things that are taking place in East Asia as well, because um, China's growing and becoming something too. And they're challenging, but they're not necessarily our friends either. You know, we have no friends. So because of the way technology is advancing, um, you're going to have genetic engineering. They're going to build humans with, you know, spectacular capabilities that normal humans don't have in effect they're gonna create uh, another human species with superior physical and mental intellectual uh, abilities. But of course, we're not at the forefront of this technology. So this is primarily gonna be taking place um, in the West and in the East. And this is a problem because if you have a population that feels threatened and yet they're gonna have abilities like this, uh, then they're gonna use that ability to try to maintain uh, the position they have so with artificial intelligence, along with what they're gonna do with genetic engineering, uh, social control will be easier than, than it ever has been um, before. So you really can have a minority maintain control of the majority. And with the population growth we're looking at, uh, we'd be naive to think that that population growth is gonna be allowed to happen without somebody with power who doesn't look like us trying to do something um, about that. So the biggest current threat uh, to the white supremacy matrix is, you know, the, the country down there in red with the big yellow star um, in the middle. Um, they are behaving the way you need to behave uh, to really challenge it. Um, they, they have a billion people acting in a cooperative manner. Uh, one of the questions I was asked earlier was about how do you fight that white supremacy culture? Well, the way China is doing it educationally, they are pushing their culture, their history, their identity, their preferences and values. They are pounding their own people with it in schools and everywhere you look. So they're doing the best they can to turn themselves into a very strong team and to culturally shield themselves from harmful values and standards that are coming out of the West. So because they have, you know, all this structural support to do that, um, they're really rounding out now into a very powerful team that can oppose, you know, the most powerful nation um, in the world. And we, we don't really have this. Even in Africa, we don't have um, the institutions trying to pound our own identity and culture and so forth the way we need to, so that you behave in a more coordinated, cooperative manner to now build up your cultural competitiveness. And you know, China's giving you a, a big blueprint on how it's done. So uh, they have a competitive advantage. Uh, we, we can't forget um, that it's a competition ever. So whatever ideas we have, you always have to understand you're in a competition. How do those ideas operate? It's not just what we do. What are they doing in competition with you, with us. You also have to have strategies and tactics to deal with what your competitor is going to do along with developing yourself and your own cultural um, competitiveness. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you so much for that, Christopher. I think we should jump straight into some of these discussion points and questions uh, while we prepare to close. We do have enough time. So once again, I dropped a message in the chat for everyone. Please, for this part of Q&A, 
I will encourage you to wave your virtual hand, be chosen and uh, use your microphone, turn on your camera, try to speak directly to our, our guest lecturer. We already have one hand up and if they don't come up, I do still have many questions in the pipeline that I have noted down. So thank you for those submissions as well. But please, if you've already submitted one and it hasn't been asked yet, just raise your hand and you will have a chance to speak. So let me have a look. Mr. Joe Dash, go ahead and unmute, you're up. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chris, for another great lecture. I'll call the end of it. Um, you are talking about pushing cultural identity out there and trying to compete on that level. One thing I've noticed just from coming from an entertainment background is that black culture is one of the most potent cultures I've ever seen worldwide. When you talk, all of every culture's children want to look and sound like us. How do we refine that? Because they seem to want to sound and look like not the best version of us, but it's not cohesive, it's not entrenched in real African philosophy, it's, it's pop culture. But I remember, you know, traveling around the world on tour and just seeing every from India to China, all the kids wear their hat like us, where their trousers like us, they want to talk like us, they're pissed, they're tattooing. So how do we make better use of that? Because I think that is the most powerful vehicle I have seen so far as far as cultural, you know, flying that flag for black culture. So how do we refine that a bit so it's more in line of, you know, competing versus just segregating, self-segregating, if that makes sense. Right, that's a, a very good question. And I, I kind of had a whole chapter that kind of dealt with that. Um, so really it's about content because what you're talking about is like our music, our entertainment, our dance, or a lot of our behavioral practices, they find it very attractive. We have a way of displaying and expressions. So in some ways um, that cultural ability we have outcompetes that ability in other cultures. So like you were talking about when you travel, so you know, I used to live in Asia for a while and certain like our dance and our music and things like that, our dress style, even body language, um, yeah. they outcompete what goes on in those other countries. They find it more attractive from us than they do their own culture. What we have to do is make sure the content is functional and not dysfunctional. We have to make sure it's adaptive and not maladaptive. So if if we've got, you know, I think I talked about it in the last lecture or the first one where the white music executives, they're basically the gatekeepers to the content. So what they want to push is the stereotypical image of us. So earlier, I don't think you were here for that part of the lecture where I talked about Chadwick Boseman rejecting a role or he got fired from a role because he wouldn't play the stereotypical black dumb gangster from the ghetto family where the mother's a prostitute and the dad's a criminal yeah. and all. Right. So he rejected because that would be maladaptive culture now, right? They, they are trying to define us and have us internalize that view of us. So this is content. So you have to push that content out and the content has to be positive, but still using our popular ways of displaying and expressing culture. So it's more like, you know, when you have, let's say like conscious rappers. Yeah, yeah. They, where they're kind of teaching history and other types of things through their rap and it can be very, very popular as well. Yeah. That would be where you have adaptive cultural content that can spread globally. And of course, because it's a black person doing it, we'll pay more attention to it. So right. particularly with our young people, that is a way you broadcast adaptive, positive culture and get people to kind of cooperate and coordinate through that cultural learning. So really it's about content. So you keep the structure the same. So you don't throw hip hop away. You just change the content of hip hop and then it works. Thank you for that, Chris. That makes sense. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much for that, Joe. Uh, we have some time for a few more questions. Would anybody like to wave their hand? Go ahead. Don't be shy, guys, and you can use your camera too. All right. While we wait for anyone to do that, um, oh, we have a hand up over here. Joe again. Okay, before we choose you, Joe, to, to ask a second, or is it a follow-up? You know what, let's hear from you in case it is a follow-up. No, no, I'll, I'll bring my 
my hands up because no one else asked. I'll ask. I'll give space for other people to ask as well. Okay, no problem. Then please feel free to 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 raise that hand again. Now the question we have here is from Dao. Uh, and we might need a little bit of clarification on this, but he says, mathematically, can a smaller fraction be more bigger than the larger fraction? Therefore, can we truly call it dominance? I think this is in relation to uh, well, the topic of dominance. Does that make sense as a question to you? Yeah, I think I might need a bit more clarification of what he's speaking of. Is, is he uncomfortable with saying that we're not socially dominant right now? Dao, if you hear us, if you're there, uh, please do chime in on that. We'll move on to a hand that's up right now, Jamika. One moment. I, oh, I'll come off camera. Go ahead. You ready? Oh. Yes. I just wanted to, I guess, make a comment in terms of the uh, idea of not bringing race into the conversation. I like your um, your response because when I talk to black people about it, a lot of people, a lot of black people like to come from the, you know, love is love, let's integrate, and they don't. To me, they're not defining a problem correctly. Meaning, it's not like black and white people used to be friends, and there was some disagreement, and then we just need to shake hands and everything would be okay. These people were deliberate in their actions towards us: the enslavement, the raping, the selling of babies and setting up a system where we could never you know, achieve equality. And so you, you have to always think about it as race, as ideal. You know, we, we want to think of, um, we know everybody are human and it would be nice and, and beautiful if we could just all be happy and you know, live together in harmony. But you're dealing with people who has, you know, they're getting advantages from setting up a system where they're at the top and some people at the bottom. So they have no motivation of destroying their system they have no motivation of including us. It, they need us to be at the bottom. So I think you, you have to talk about race because there is no other solution and you have to divorce yourself from this, from this system and figure out how you're gonna create a new life for yourself. Right, um, she's, you're, you're, you're correct, Jamaica, in that even when we look at it scientifically, um, you have to coordinate around a group identity. If you don't have the group identity, the level of cooperation you're looking for doesn't work. And also, we have a competitor that we're dealing with. And the, the research that's coming out right now is showing that white identity is becoming more salient. They are becoming very aware of their racial identity and behaving in a way to advance the domination of their group because they are feeling threatened. Now, this shows you two things. First, when 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 the group feels threatened, the sense of identity strengthens. So the research is showing that white identity is strengthening. They are showing more solidarity towards white people, towards themselves. So I can understand some people who are uncomfortable with this idea of race, whether it's a social construct or not, or anything. Just looking at it from the scientific perspective of how do you get a group to behave in its own interests? One of the things you have to have is that group identity. So first of all, the problem we are facing is racial. The problem is based on what we look like and how people respond to us. When we want to advance ourselves, the dominant group are feeling threatened and they are now acting in coordination, more solidarity around their white identity. As a matter of fact, a book was recently published called White Identity Politics that did a lot of this research and also here in England, we had, uh, I think, I forgot his first name is Kaufman. I think it's called um, White Shift or something, where he also is talking about now the white identity becoming more important. They are acting now more in their own interests. So seriously, we'd be crazy not to base this around our racial identity and understanding we now have to show more solidarity towards each other. It has to be around that tribal identity of race because if not, we are now less cooperative. We are not working together. We are not pro-social towards each other because we don't have that unifying identity that will cause us to collaborate and invest in each other, which now weakens our ability to compete with a group that is now intensifying its efforts to compete against everybody who's not white. And I'm not just talking off the top of my head. There's research around this. Uh, if you go in my book, 
Uh, actually, we're going to do that lecture. Nigel wanted that lecture. So demographics, economics, and politics, we're going to get into the studies that show white people, their identity is strengthening, and they are now behaving more in cooperation with each other to maintain their dominance. So earlier in the lecture, I talked about the dominant group acting more in its own interests than the subordinate group does. That's an example of that taking place right now as we speak. 